Okay, thank you, Jyrki, for those kind words. And today I'll be talking about what is this prescriptive analytics and how does it help decision making. So what is happening in the world today is that digitalization of businesses and society at large is creating new sources of data. And at the same time, the increasing computational power is leading to a situation where organizations more and more base their decisions on using mathematical models to analyze and get insights from this data. And within analytics, we can kind of recognize three different levels. So first of all, we have descriptive analytics, looking at the data, getting insight on what has happened to the system of interest. The second level looks into the future. It's predictive analytics. So what will happen to the uh, system in the future? And finally, the decision-making part of analytics, prescriptive analytics, what should we as decision-makers do to steer the system in a direction that we want? So some, some examples of analytics applications that I've had, had the pleasure to work on here in Aalto with some of, some of amazing colleagues and industry collaborators whose name you can see there at the bottom. So in Work in, in retail, distribution centers have to reserve workforce to handle incoming orders before they actually know how many orders they actually receive. So the black line there are the actual orders. So to do this, you can do some uh, naive prediction. The red line doesn't really help, but what you really need is a probability distribution on the number of orders you receive each day throughout several months and why do you need a distribution? Because the costs of having too much workforce on one hand and the cost of having too little are not the same. So to minimize expected costs on the long run, you really need a probability distribution on the number of orders. Similarly, in hydropower production planning, you need to decide on the production for the following 24 hours how much electricity you will pr produce without really knowing exactly the sp electricity spot prices. To make this decision more complicated, well, you have the fl uh, fluid dynamics of the river system, you have uncertainties related to the weather, how much it will rain, how much water you have to produce electricity. So all of this to identify the optimal production plan is really not possible manually, but you, it requires use of mixed integer linear programming. The final example is from a pulp and paper company that uses natural gas to run its operations. You can see that the variation of, of, in how much gas they need for one hour is quite large. And you can hedge against this variation by using pro, uh, procurement contracts. But finding the real optimal mix of different contracts, the optimal quantities, is not really possible without the use of stochastic optimization. So, how do you use prescriptive analytics? Well, it's simple. You take your data, your facts, maybe some forecasts you have obtained from using predictive analytics, put them, put them into the funnel and out pops a decision. And that's the end of my talk. Of course, it's not this simple. Many challenges here. One, framing the problem. What do we include in the model? What are the decision variables? Do we have data? Can we use directly data? Often not. We have to clean the data. We have to choose which kinds of optimization methods we use to produce the decision recommendations. But more importantly, and the fact that I want to, or the challenge I want to discuss today is that how does prescriptive analytics know what we should do if it doesn't know what we want? And of course, it cannot do that. So requirement of using prescriptive analytics is that somehow we have to tell it explicitly or implicitly what the decision maker wants. And this is something that cannot be obtained from any objective database out there. But it really, really requires interaction with the decision maker, the decision maker thinking about her values, turning these into concrete objectives, and thinking about preferences between different uh, objectives or preferences with regard to risk. And this is the field in which decision analysis, my field of study, really works at. 
putting, um, putting all these soft issues like values, objectives into the formal language of mathematics that, then that can then be used inside the pre prescriptive analytics models. On the theory level, what does decision analysis do? Well, it's, it develops and offers axiomatic preference models. What does this mean? Well, axiom is, axioms are assumptions about preferences, kind of what, uh, assumptions about what rational preferences should look like. Here's one very simple example. The transitivity of preferences. If I prefer alternative A to B, and then when I look at, I prefer B to C, then if I'm rational, I really should prefer A to this alternative C. And then a bunch of us decision analysis researchers work in our dark chambers to derive the mathematical for proofs and formulations to find a set of value functions to represent the types of preferences that satisfy these axioms. And then what we get is a family of value functions and we can use this to rank the decision alternatives. We compute the value of alternative A, if that's bigger than the value we compute for alternative B, then A is better than B. And this work to establish the axiomatic foundations has been going on since the 40s and 50s. So originally uh, a lot of emphasis on decision making under uncertainty, later looking at decision settings with multiple uh, decision objectives, looking at both money and the environment, for instance. What we have been doing in Alta for the past, during the past 10 years is looking at portfolio decisions, decisions where you're not choosing one of the mutually exclusive decision alternatives, but you are looking for the best combination of alternatives. And also we've been looking at spatial decisions in which the outcomes of the decision alternatives are distributed along some spatial area, let's say geographical, a map of a country, for instance. So is it, enough, is it enough to have a axiomatic preference model? So we have here new professors, they are probably very rational, they follow the rationality axioms. But does it mean that Katri and Kalle, faced by the same decision pro problem, would make the same decision? Or should they make the same decision? Of course not. The axioms only define a family or a set of value functions and to narrow down the focus to a smaller set of value functions or even a unique value function, we need preference information. And how do we obtain this preference information? Well, we interact with the decision maker. We ask, for instance, let's put profits and CO2 emissions on some baseline level and then we ask the decision maker, would you rather increase the profits by 100,000 euros or decrease the CO2 emissions by 8%? And any answer to this question will give us information about the trade-offs between these decision objectives of, of, of increasing profits and minimizing CO2 emissions. As another example, which one would you choose? I give you 10,000 euros for certain, or you get a ticket to a lottery in which you have a 50% chance of winning 20,000 euros. And of course, 50% chance of getting nothing. Answer to this question will give us information on your risk preferences. And when we collect this preference information, it allows us to reduce the set of value functions that is compatible with the axioms by removing those that are compatible with the axioms, but not really compatible with the preference uh, information we have obtained. And this has been studied in Alta even before my time, so I have to mention these honorable professors who have worked in this field of using preference information to, to reduce the set of compatible value functions. So how does the preference information work in practice? Here's one example. And Originally it was about air defense planning, but to keep things peaceful, let's assume we are trying to provide helicopter rescue services across this imaginary country. And what we are doing is building two bases, two main bases on one of the two of the locations A, B and C. And then we are building three secondary bases to the five locations numbered one, from one to five. So each combination of bases results in a different kind of 
rescue service coverage across this imaginary country. And of course, it, all the areas of the country are not equally important. It's important to have rescue services in those places where you have a lot of population. Maybe it's those urban areas that are marked with uh, red circles. So given, if the decision maker gives information on the relative importance, preference information on the relative importance of these different areas, what can we do? We don't maybe get a unique value function, but for all the compatible value functions, we are able to find that out of the 30 possible decision alternatives or base combinations, only three really make sense. These three ones which are colored green here. So if we look at those three, if we if we chose one of the white ones, we would find a green one that is better ranked for all the compatible value functions. A second example, which shows that even very modest preference information can result in qualitative decision recommendations is this one. Here we are looking at how to diverse our investments across 10, uh, 10 industries using the historical stock returns in the US. And we are just assuming that the decision maker is risk averse, meaning that uh, she would pay money, she would, she would be willing to lose money on average if that reduced the uncertainty in the uh, returns she gets. And if we look at the results here, we see that out of the 10 industries, almost half are such that we should put no money into those, only by assuming risk aversion. And here's another example, again looking at the future, but really building a strategy. So this is from a real case where three companies were formulating their uh, platform ecosystem strategy. They had a lot of future scenarios. They came up with these 23 strategic actions that if they implement now, they would be better off if one of those future scenarios happened. And you can imagine that in this kind of a case, Getting preference information is pretty difficult. It's, for every, anyone, it's very hard to think about what would be good in that type of a future and what kind of things would be allow what kind of things would allow our organization to succeed in this kind of future. So as a result, we have a lot of different value function, functions generating different kind of optimal portfolios of these strategic actions. But if we look at the composition of these portfolios, we see that there are some similarities. At the bottom there, we have all of these actions that are not included in any of the optimal portfolios, so we shouldn't take those. And then again, on the top, we see two actions that are included in all of the optimal portfolios, and those are something we should definitely do. And the rest are subject to further analysis and negotiation and further information we receive when the time passes on and the future comes closer to us. So to conclude, my main takeaway from the main takeaway from this talk is that yes, prescriptive analytics can help in decision making. Why? Because it addresses the question not what has happened, what will happen, but really what we should do to steer the system on a course that we actually want. But the answer to this question, what, do, what should we do, it doesn't come from data. It requires that we model the preferences of the decision maker. And decision analysis helps in this. It offers axiomatic uh, preference models that have a strong basis in what we perceive as rational decision making. It offers us tools and processes to interact with the decision maker to obtain additional preference information. And finally, decision analysis gives us the computational methods to produce decision recommendations that are consistent with the rationality axioms underlying our model, but also the preference information we have obtained from the decision maker. Thank you.